Hello everybody, it's Rose and I'm back with another video of me drilling this pastel dragonfly. Uh, it's a round kit from the Art Back Sticking Embroidery Company and um, I am going to be uh, reading another chapter of The Magnate's Manifesto by Jennifer Hayward. It's a Harlequin Presents novel. Those of you who haven't yet listen to chapters one and two, we'll be able to find all of the current chapters that have been published up in the little eye in the right hand top corner of your screen. Be assured that in the cards that come up at the very end of the video, you'll have a link to that playlist with all of the chapters that I've recorded of the Magnate's Manifesto. So, uh, I'm ready to move on to the next section of this diamond painting. So what I do is I push the diamond painting up under the bar here. And uh, I just, I have this um, drawer liner from Ikea that I have over top of it. That'll prevent drills from, you know, getting scratched or anything like that by the ball bearings on this thing. And, uh, and then I can put my trash container here and this is what I empty the trash into for this diamond painting and then I just have this this is just you know mixed drills that I pick up off the floor or out of my bed or whatever um, wherever I happen to find loose drills and uh, every now and again whoops every now and again I put them in my mixed drill jar um, but now I'm going to move this down and I'm going to do half of what's left of this diamond painting in this next uh, piece that I'm going to drill. I'm not sure if you can actually see what I'm doing. Okay, yeah, there, now you can see it. So I've uh, folded this back. Um, but I want to fold it back nice and straight. There, okay. So it's nice and straight. And I actually don't want all this extra paper so I'm just tearing it off and throwing it away all right and then I have my silicone baking mat silicone baking mat and I always get asked where do you get them I get the I got these on Amazon I have this one which is about 15 centimeters by 20 centimeters uh, let's see yeah it's 20 and a half and it's yeah 30 centimeters so 15 by 30 or 20 by 30 and the other one is 30 by 40 and uh they came as a as a set of two uh on amazon.ca but you can order them on amazon.com uh they come in singles they come in doubles and they come in uh, kits of three i love these things uh you can use them instead of uh, paper because it's silicone so it doesn't stick to anything it's a baking mat it's so that your cookies don't stick but your glue won't stick either so if I wanted to let's say just work a smaller area here I could lay this down it protects my hand uh, and uh, and then I can just pull it up or sometimes what I do is I'll lay it down here and I'll drill along here but um, but for now, I think I'll just I'll just put it here. I might adjust it as we go along. Um, yeah. So I'm reading a book called The Magnate's Manifesto. It's a Harlequin Presents novel. The author is Jennifer Hayward. I'm not going to speed this up because uh, the time lapse feature on my camera does uh, five like it. It's five minutes becomes one minute. And so to do a half hour video, I have to drill for two and a half hours. So to do a one hour video, I'd have to uh, do time lapse. Uh, like I'd have to be in time lapse mode for five hours. And um, I just, I don't feel like doing another six or seven, five hour marathons of diamond painting to get a one hour video. Um, so I will do shorter stints and get more videos made. Um, it takes forever to edit these, uh, these readings 
because um, every time I make a mistake in reading, I have to cut it out and uh, and like I have to, well, I have to edit. And so uh, usually I don't go a full minute without <laughs> having to edit. So I will now head on into doing the reading of The Magnate's Manifesto by Jennifer Hayward. The Magnate's Manifesto, Chapter 3. Bailey yanked herself out from under Jared's hands so fast she pretty much redid all the damage he'd just undone. Her hazy brain wasn't firing on all cylinders as she met her boss's glittering blue gaze, focused and intent, containing the same heated sexual awareness that had been fueling her unspeakable fantasy. She thought, hot and uncensored, it had been outrageously good. We, I... She started to talk, anything to deny what was happening. Jared held up a hand. There's only one thing that's called, Bailey. Pure, unadulterated sexual attraction. Her pulse racing, hectic color firing her cheeks. It was really pointless to deny it. But it would be insanity not to. There goes your out-of-control ego again, Jared, she taunted, raising her chin. You antagonize me, you drive me crazy, but you do not attract me. His jaw hardened. The glitter in his eyes morphed into a spark of pure challenge as his I am man, chest-beating need to prove his masculinity roared to life. Her breath stopped in her lungs. Her irrational desire to see what would happen if he did lose it, mixing with her common sense to create a complete state of inertia. Then his dark lashes came down to shield his eyes, that superior control he exerted over himself sliding back into place. I think, he said softly, this is a case of semantics. Antagonize, attract, whatever you want to call it, it's an issue, and we need to figure it out if we're going to make this presentation work, if we're going to make this partnership work. She pulled in a silent breath. She pulled in a silent breath, using the reprieve to steady herself, to regain her equilibrium. He was right. She needed to figure this antagonism attraction thing out before she made a complete fool of herself, before she destroyed this opportunity she'd been handed. How about, she offered, with as cool a gaze as she could muster, you try to be a little looser, go with the flow, and I'll pay more attention to the script. I'm sure even we can meet somewhere in the middle. His mouth tilted up on one side. It's worth a shot. They dined on a delicious meal of filet mignon and salad. Bailey severely curtailing her consumption of the delicious wine so her head was clear. She'd made a serious mistake in ever thinking she could let her defenses down in front of Jared. In tipping her hand and revealing an attraction she hadn't even fully admitted to herself. But she'd learned her lesson, and she wasn't about to do it again. Their final rehearsal wasn't perfect, but it was a heck of a lot better than their earlier attempts. She toned it down, made a concerted effort to follow Jared's lead, and they made it through in a fairly civilized way. Jared, being the generous soul that he was, gave her a couple of hours sleep before they landed in the sparkling, glittering south of France. Just how luxurious their trip was going to be was apparent when, upon their arrival in the Nice airport, they were not met by a car, but by a shiny silver helicopter flown by David Gagnon's personal pilot. He jumped down under the slowing, still-whirling helicopter blades, greeted them, stowed their luggage in the back of the aircraft, and took them on their way. Their trip across the sun-kissed Côte d'Azur to the legendary peninsula of billionaires in between Nice and Monaco featured some of the most exclusive properties on the French Riviera. Bailey, who'd done the south of France on a budget in her backpacking days with Aria, was googly-eyed. Luxurious villas sat in secluded coves behind high cliffs that sheltered them from the wind. And the colors were glorious. Brilliant fuchsia and purple-soaked gardens bordering the sparkling turquoise sea. Jared gave her an amused look as she chatted with the pilot 
extending her 20 questions strategy to him. It was presently a balmy 21 degrees Celsius, the pilot told them as he set the chopper down on the Gagnon property's private landing pad. Expected to get much hotter over the weekend, just in time for the film festival season in the south of France. They were met outside the low, cream-colored, sprawling villa that sat directly on the bay by David Gagnon's head housekeeper, who informed them their host was en route from a business meeting and would greet them that night at the party. Until then, they were free to explore the grounds and beach and enjoy some lunch. Bailey forced some salad into her jet-lagged body, took one look at her oceanfront suite, situated directly beside Jared's at one end of a wing, and elected for a face plant into the 300-count Egyptian cotton sheets and an afternoon nap. When she woke, the brilliant afternoon sun had faded into early evening, and a sensual pink-orange sunset was streaking its way across the sky. She yawned, padded to her terrace, and watched as it deepened into a hot pink fire laced with smoky gray-blue. She would have done just about anything to be able to sit there and enjoy the magnificent view with a glass of the wine on ice in her suite, but it was already close to six. She needed to shower, dress, and face the jeweled, exquisitely coutured guests of David Gagnon in half an hour and hoped she had learned enough over the years to fake it so her lowbrow, uncouth roots didn't show through like an ugly weed in a sea of mimosa and lavender. Put her in a boardroom matched against the world's nastiest dealmaker, and she was rock solid. Put her in a social situation like tonight, and she needed all her acting skills to survive. Etiquette training had only taught her which fork to use, which wine to drink with what, It didn't make her one of them, and it never would. She gazed out at the explosion of color in the sky and reminded herself parties like this were about working a room. If there was anything she'd learned as a dancer, it was that. How to get what she wanted out of the men who'd come to watch her so she could make a different life for herself. And tonight was no different. She needed to focus on the prize, David Gagnon. Use what she'd learned about him what she knew of men like him, to convince him a Stone Industries partnership was his ticket to European sales domination. Show Jared he'd been overlooking a valuable asset for a very long time. Once she got over her nerves. She reluctantly abandoned the gorgeous view and stepped inside. She might not be able to enjoy the sunset, but she could indulge in a glass of wine to ease the tension. Pouring herself a glass, She took it into the stunning marble bathroom, stepped under a hot shower, and systematically washed away the old bailey and installed the new one in her place. Wrapping herself in the thick, soft robe that hung on the door, she padded into the dressing area and ran her fingers over the whisper-soft silks and taffetas she'd hung in the wardrobe. But there was never any question as to which she'd pick. She pulled the the just-above-the-knee beaded champagne-colored cocktail dress from the hanger and slipped it on. The dress was the softest silk, hugging every curve with just the right amount of propriety. Sexy but conservative at the same time. She surveyed herself in the floor-length mirror. There was nothing cheap about the woman who looked back at her. This was not the $20 designer knockoff dress that had once been the only thing she could afford, and it showed. Working her hair into a smooth, shimmering mass of curls with a round brush and a dryer, she topped it with minimal eye makeup and gloss, enough to highlight her features. She had just added a dash of perfume to her pulse points when a knock sounded at the connecting door, Jared. She moved across the room, undid the bolts, and opened the door. The sight of her boss in an exquisitely tailored black tux might have been more intimidating than the prospect of the evening ahead. From the tip of his slicked back dark hair to his freshly shaven jaw and long-limbed masculinity, he was devastating. Jared followed Bailey into her suite, her barefoot, wine-in-her-hand invitation to come in doing something strange to his insides. 
Her dress, what would you call it, champagne colored, hugged every curve as if it had been sewn onto her. Curves that could burn themselves into your memory if you let them. Her hair fell in smooth golden waves to her shoulders, one side pushed back with a diamond butterfly clasp. Her exquisite face held only the faintest trace of war paint, but she was the most beautiful woman he'd ever stepped foot into a room with. That he knew. He attempted to divert his wayward thoughts with a thoughtful look down at the floor tapestry and instead treated himself to a perfect view of her long golden legs, ruby tipped toes sinking into the carpet. And he felt himself lose the plot completely. If she'd been a woman he was dating, he would have skipped the cocktails entirely, insisted she share her wine while they watched the sunset together, taken the dress off her with his teeth and made her come at least twice before they joined the others. And that didn't take into account what he would have done to her after the night was over. He would have had her until sunrise. Jared? He coughed and lifted his gaze to hers. Sorry? A pink stain stole over her cheeks. The gold or champagne shoes? He looked at the two pairs of sky-high heels dangling from her fingertips and decided either of them would make every man in the room tonight want to bed her. Gold, he muttered. It'll contrast with the dress. Right. She tossed the other pair on the carpet, braced her hand against the wall, and slipped the stilettos on. As his hormone-clouded brain cleared, he noticed the tight set of her face, the way her ramrod straight posture seemed to have pulled up another centimeter how she picked up the glass of wine and down the remainder with a jerky movement reminiscent of his father on the nights he'd had to attend the bank functions he'd never been comfortable with, except his drink had been scotch. The chink in her armor confounded him. Are you nervous? You know the plan. We find out Maison's strategy when it comes to the environment, and we're all set. It's the last missing piece. A stillness slipped across her fine-boned face, indecipherable. I've got the plan down, Jared. I'm fine. He didn't buy it for a second. Her revelations on the plane had illuminated one thing about Bailey. She hadn't been born into this lifestyle. She did a good job making it look as though she had, but she hadn't. He stepped closer, something about her vulnerability touching him deep down inside. Don't you know, he said softly, looking down at her, you're always the most beautiful woman in the room, Bailey, and the smartest. A small smile twisted her lips before she wrinkled her nose at him. I'll bet that line works wonders for you. You have no idea. His answering grim was self-effacing, but I've never meant it more than I do now. So be yourself tonight and you'll knock him dead. She studied him for a moment, nodded. We should go. For what reason he didn't know, he braved her prickly exterior and wrapped his fingers around her delicate hand instead of offering his arm. Ready? He asked roughly. Ready. They emerged on the buzzing wraparound terrace of the villa, ablaze with light and laughter on the warm Mediterranean night, where perhaps close to 50 people had already gathered, cocktails in hand. As Jared cased the crowd, he noticed an Academy Award-winning producer to his left, a high-profile A-list Hollywood couple to his right, and wasn't that Roberto something or other, the Italian film director known for his sprawling epics, straight ahead? The big personalities had, apparently, all made it into town. He grabbed a couple of glasses of champagne from a passing waiter's tray and handed one to Bailey. Gagnon had spared no expense. A quartet playing in a corner of the large, flood-lit deck, black-jacketed staff circulating like an efficient swarm of bees, and from what he'd heard, a well-known French singer slated to play later in the evening, purportedly a mistress of one of the French cabinet ministers. But Jared had only one goal in mind, to corner David Gagnon and get the information he needed to develop that final, crucial piece of strategy. He did not miss the attention every man at the party paid to the woman by his side as he picked out Gagnon, placed a palm to Bailey's back, and led her through the crowd. There were a lot of beautiful, stunning even, women at the party. 
Bailey outshone them all, glittering like a glamorous Hollywood icon brought forward to the present, outclassing even the real Hollywood A-listers in attendance, if you were to ask his opinion. But in true Bailey style, she ignored them all and focused on their target. David Gagnon detached himself from the group he was standing with and came toward them. His sun-lined, handsome, younger-looking than he was face breaking into a wide smile as he took Bailey's hand and brought it to his mouth. My pilot told me you were lovely, he murmured gallantly. I think he erred on the conservative side. Bailey gave their host a warm smile and returned his greeting in French in perfectly accented, lilting Parisian French that sounded so sexy, Jared's jaw dropped open. I think I'm in love, David murmured, hanging onto her hand. What are you doing with the most controversial man in the room, ma chère? And the most brilliant, Bailey returned smoothly as she drew back, an amused sparkle lighting her blue eyes. I'm with him for his brain. Jared's gaze tangled with hers. She appreciated a lot more than his brain. He was sure of it, and he suddenly had the burning urge to make her admit it. Maybe it was the look of pure male appreciation on David's face. Maybe it had been the scene with the shoes. Regardless, it was out of the question. He had to be a good boy. He was on a very short leash with no room for error. You have an absolutely magnificent home, he murmured appreciatively when David finally deigned to let go of Bailey's hand and offer him his. Thank you for the invitation to join you. It only increased the desirability of my guest list, the distinguished Frenchman said in a wry tone. Like you or hate you, they'll all want to meet you. Jared caught the disapproval the Frenchman lobbed him loud and clear. It was a personal joke that should never have been made public, he asserted. But it was, David drawled, and now you've alienated 50% of the population. Tension tightened his jaw. It will blow over. Gagnon's eyes glinted. That's what Richard Braden thought when his comments about the French were broadcast on YouTube. His gaze was deliberate. It destroyed his business. A fist reached in and wrapped itself around his heart. Gagnon could not have missed the business stories depicting him teetering on a high wire when it came to retaining control of his company. His radical push in a direction few dared to go. The Frenchman's deal would push him over the edge one way or another, and David knew it. It will blow over, Jared reiterated harshly. And when you see what we have in our marketing plan, you will not have any doubts, I promise you. The other man inclined his head. I expect brilliance from you, Stone. It's the wild cards you throw my way I'm not so sure about. Jared gritted his teeth as Gagnon blew off the conversation and turned to introduce them around. Turned to introduce Bailey around, if he were to be accurate. With himself in David's bad books, she apparently was a more enticing draw. He spent the rest of the cocktail hour deflecting conversation of his manifesto, which truly seemed to have struck a global note. Heartily sick of it, and inordinately annoyed with himself, he was then seated next to Gagnon's daughter, Michelin, for dinner. Whether a joke or penance on David's part, Jared thought he'd died and gone to hell by the main course. Michelin had not let up over the soup and appetizers about how damaging his effort to be cute was to women, how much it denigrated everything she'd worked for. By the time the Cornish hens came, he would have laid down on the floor and allowed her to stick needles in every part of him if she would have stopped. Just stopped. Bailey, of course, had been placed beside David. She spent the evening chatting away to him in that perfect French he didn't understand so he couldn't follow their conversation. Apparently, she had lost her nerves. Micheline glanced over at her father and Bailey, her thin mouth curving into a cynical smile. She was a brilliant stroke of strategy on your part, Jared, no doubt about it. You know Daddy can't resist a beautiful blonde. She's extremely smart, Jared muttered, and annoying. He needed to be in on that conversation. But it didn't happen. Dessert stretched into liqueurs and no one moved. Finally, 
The French singer took the stage on the terrace, the band backing her up, and Jared seized the opportunity to grab his CMO. Care for a dance, he requested on a slightly belligerent note, holding out his hand. She nodded and excused herself from David's side. Jared's long strides ate up the distance to the dance floor set up on a corner of the balcony. He slid an arm around Bailey's waist, laced his fingers through hers, and pulled her to him. When were you planning on including me in your little party? She absorbed that, absorbed his frustration, then sighed. You told me to work him, Jared. That's what I'm doing. Awfully well. She sealed her bottom lip over her top. When were you going to tell me you spoke French? That was also on my resume, she said pointedly, along with the fact that I speak Spanish and Italian. I have a feeling that resume of yours isn't worth the paper it's printed on, he said darkly, inhaling that trademark floral scent of hers, trying to ignore what she'd look like stripped of that dress, what his psyche had been working on all evening. What other tricks do you have up your sleeve? Just so I have a heads up. Her perfectly arched brows came together. I know it must be disconcerting that David's being a bit cool with you, but you can't blame me for that. I'm not blaming you. I'm wondering who you are. You whip out this perfect French I didn't know you speak, then you're off talking about Plato over dinner. I studied that in college. He's David's favorite philosopher. Of course he is. He's also clearly besotted with you. Her calm look hardened until she was matching him, stare for stare. I am using my brain, Jared, something the women you consort with likely don't do. I can understand why you would find that hard to appreciate. I appreciate your brain. Right, she echoed his skepticism. He's revealing a lot. I'm getting some good insights into how his brain works. I've run some ideas by him and... You've run some ideas by him? Fury twisted his insides. I don't want you running ideas by him. I want you sticking to the script. Her lips pressed together. He liked them, loved them, in fact. He kept a leash on himself as the urge to explode like an overdue volcano rolled over him. Which ideas are we talking about? The ones in our presentation or your rogue thoughts? Hot color dusted her cheeks. One of mine the one about the kiosks in the yoga studios. He uttered a curse. That is not in our plan. It is nowhere in our plan, nor is it going to be. You need to put a leash on yourself. She lifted her chin, her blue eyes a stormy gray. He loved the idea, Jared. He said it was exactly where his head was at. So maybe you need to open up your mind, use your imagination. I am using my imagination, he came back shortly his gaze sliding over the dress, the curves every man in the room hadn't been able to take his eyes off all night. And I don't like where it's taking me. She swallowed, a visible big gulp. Do not do that. We are negotiating a business deal here, remember? Focus. I am focusing, he countered sulkily. Like every other male at this party, you have my complete attention in that dress. Now, what are you going to do with it? Her eyes widened. Fire arced between them, swift and strong. It made his blood tattoo through his veins in a triumphant march, set his heart lancing through his body. Bailey stared back at him like a deer caught in the headlights for a long moment. Then she blinked and stepped out of his arms. Walk away, she said softly. You know, the magazines are right about you, Jared. You're the one who needs a leash. You are out of control. You have lost your focus. You might think about getting it back. Think about what's actually going to win this rather than your own ego. He stood there, hands clenched by his sides with the need to strangle her. She started off, then turned back with a final parting shot. Green is only a peripheral strategy for David. He recognizes the importance to consumers, but he also knows they aren't willing to pay a premium for it. It's the price of entry. She left before he could say anything, wound her way back through the crowd, and he wondered if she was right. Was he out of control? Had he lost the thread? Because all he'd ever wanted to do was build a company that created great products, that made the impossible possible, 
But now that he'd done that, now that he was close to the pinnacle of success, he was doing everything but. He was glad-handing politicians, massaging a board's ego, weighing in on a marketing strategy he shouldn't have to worry about. About as far from the business of inspiration as you could get. It was making him crazy. He acknowledged one more thing before he bit out a curse and followed Bailey through the crowd. The yoga kiosk idea was brilliant. He'd thought that when she'd mentioned it, but final rehearsals weren't any time to be going off script. Hell, he told Sam this would happen. He should have listened to his instincts. Bailey spent the rest of the evening trying to manage the thundercloud that was Jared. She had the distinct feeling David Gagnon was administering a slap on the hand to her boss by giving him the cold shoulder, because there was no doubt that he respected Jared immensely. She felt as if she was doing damage control on all sides. She also felt that she was the missing piece of the puzzle, the link between Jared's brilliance and David's creative side. David loved her ideas. He thought they were grassroots, buzz-inducing genius. And it made her feel just this side of cocky as she stood at the two men's sides for a last brandy as the crowd dwindled on that star-strewn terrace. She felt empowered. My son, Alexander, has been delayed until tomorrow night, David updated them, pointing his glass at Jared. Since he will be assuming the mantle at Maison upon my retirement next year, I want him to take the lead on this partnership decision. Why don't you enjoy the day tomorrow, meet Alexander at dinner, and we can hear the presentation on Sunday. Jared, who had been raring to get the presentation nailed and over with, nodded congenially as if that were the greatest idea in the world. You're planning on stepping back over the next few months and transitioning then? David nodded. But I will still be very involved. My son is nothing if not ambitious and aggressive, but he'll need guidance. He shot Jared an amused look. You'll like him. He likes to win as much as you do. Jared smiled. Not a bad trait. But his eyes were blazing with a plan. Four or five more hours of endless rehearsal? She almost groaned out loud. She might kill him first. I should say goodbye to a guest, David observed. Then I think I'm going to turn in. I'll see you in the morning for breakfast. Bailey couldn't imagine anything better than bed. It was 2.30 a.m. Her feet were killing her from the heels. She was jet-lagged, and the mental exhaustion of maintaining such a perfect facade all night, of using the French she hadn't practiced in years, had fried her brain. And then there was Jared, who moved silently beside her into the house like a quiet, lethal animal ready to strike. She stayed quiet because taunting the animal was never a good strategy and she'd slipped during that dance, had gotten caught up in him for a split second before she'd walked away. She didn't think that was helping their harmony. The hallway stretched long and silent ahead of them. Jared stopped in front of her door, turned the handle, and pushed it open. She came to a halt beside him, tension raking over her as she risked a look up at him. Latent, unresolved antagonism stretched like a live wire between them. Jared's penetrating stare making her shift her weight to the other foot, away from him. She pulled in a breath. I shouldn't have said what... Her heart sped into overdrive as he leaned forward and braced a hand against the wall behind her, his intent, purposeful look stopping the breath in her chest. Add the yoga idea to the deck, Bailey. Blow it out big and make it sing. And don't ever ever run a strategy by a client without my approval first, or you'll have the shortest tenure an executive at Stone Industries has ever had. He had removed his hand from the wall, stepped back, and slammed his way into his room before her breath started moving again. She stood there, frozen, for about five good seconds, then closed the door behind her. She backed up against the wood frame and finally let a triumphant smile curve her lips. She had won. She had forced Jared Stone to acknowledge her ideas had merit. Not only had merit, they were going to present them to David Gagnon. The smile faded from her lips, adrenaline pounding through her, licking at her nerve endings. 
Just now, outside that door, for a split second, she'd been convinced Jared was going to kiss her. Worse, for a fraction of that second, she had been unbearably excited by the idea. Pulling in a breath, she wiped the back of her hand against her mouth. Since when had she become a fan of Russian roulette? Because surely, that's what tonight had been, with her own career at stake. She might want to start thinking up alternative strategies. And so ends Chapter 3 of The Magnate's Manifesto by Jennifer Hayward. Stay tuned for Chapter 4. It's coming in about four days. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Come back and visit with me again soon. And don't forget to like this video and leave your comments down below. Bye-bye, everyone.